We all need to keep an eye out for crime. Because thieves will steal our cash, our cars, our valuables. Just about anything they can get their hands on. Fortunately, many other eyes are looking out for criminals too. The police, local councils and businesses are using their own tricks and traps, together with cutting-edge technology, to catch the bad guys. ka we've got you. It was a great result to get that guilty plea. And the public are using secret cameras to make sure the crooks get their comeuppance. I can't let somebody like that ruin my life. We well, are definitely out for you this time. Yes, they were brought to justice. Don't call me Miss Marple for nothing. <laughs> So anyone who's up to no good had better think twice. They might just get caught red-handed. Today, pub landlord Kevin and one of his customers, Matt, are plunged into a life-threatening situation. When a man who's just been thrown out of Kevin's pub for fighting seeks revenge of a horrifying kind. He drives his car into a group of customers, including Matt, it's amazing that no one is killed in a crash that is truly shocking. Madness has happened. The voice in my head literally just went, you just died. Kevin, the landlord, fears the car's fuel tank could explode. If that car would have caught fire, the building would have been on fire. The kids were upstairs, my wife was upstairs. My next step was make sure everybody's out of this pub because the car's going to go up. Also today, Christian owns an Italian restaurant. And one night, some diners want to eat without paying. But Christian has cottoned on to I said, just watch table one, because something will happen. He's not wrong, but no one could predict what happens next. Just <laughs> 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 distraction techniques to steal a charity collection tin from a garage shop. But the shop owner isn't easily fooled even when the crooked con man tries another trick outside. Pubs are sociable places, but occasionally there's a small minority out to cause trouble. Fights can break out, but no one would ever expect an angry customer to deliberately ram their car into a pub full of people. In the small town of New Romney, there's a pub called the Sink Ports Arms. It was bought a couple of years ago by married couple Sarah and Kevin and their friend Sharon. We've had our own businesses before, fish and chip shops and restaurants, and then we decided to sell our house in 2016 and buy a pub. We put everything into it. It was dilapidated, so it was a big risk. Kevin and Sarah decided to live upstairs with their children, Tyler, Leah and Frey, and renovated and refurbished the premises. Word spread around town, and the revitalised pub soon started attracting a wide range of customers, including local plumber Matt. Everyone loves it there. It's a really good atmosphere. Meet up, drink, see where the night takes us. The business has been thriving and the family has settled in nicely until their peace of mind is shattered when what starts off as a normal night in the pub ends in catastrophe. It's a Friday night in the autumn, whose the bar is full of customers. Sarah is upstairs looking forward to an early night. She and Kevin are expecting their fourth child in a couple of months. I was seven months pregnant, so I decided to have a bit of an early night. because I. Felt Kevin is downstairs in the kitchen, unaware that there's trouble brewing in the bar. To the right, off camera, the rowdy behaviour of a 24-year-old customer is causing the staff concern. Matt in the blue jacket and other regulars have also noticed him. There's this lad at the bar that no one really knew, leaning over the bar, you know, like, you know, very drunk, like using it to prop himself up. The bar staff ask the man, who's still out of camera view, to calm down. He ignores them, so they ask him to leave. Suddenly, he becomes very aggressive. My mate's gone to the bar to get a beer, and the guys then just headbutted him, just out of the blue. So they started uh, kicking off in the pub. Matt, along with bar staff and other customers, tries to calm the situation. But the man continues to struggle violently. The situation is in danger of getting out of control, so bar staff decide to eject him from the premises. Upstairs, Sarah hears the commotion. I heard raised voices downstairs. 
So I'd gone into the office where we've got the CCTV. I see the guy get escorted out that was causing trouble. On the CCTV, Sarah watches their friend and partner Sharon walking through the bar to investigate what's going on. In the kitchen, Kevin realises something's wrong. I left the kitchen, went to the front of the building. Kevin's told about what's happened by Sharon and some customers. Inside, Matt has picked up a hat that he's found on the floor. I said to one of my mates, whose hat's that? He's like, oh, it's that guy that's been kicked out. I was like, what? I'll go give it back to him. <laughs> so I've actually gone outside to go and like, try and find him. I didn't know where he was. The troublemaker is lying in the gutter of a side street behind the pub. He's just picked a fight with someone else and come off second best. Two passers-by broke up the tussle and are encouraging him to go home. Sarah can see her husband Kevin and some customers on the CCTV covering the front of the pub. They was all just calming down, really, from the incident. Kevin notices the man getting into his vehicle in the car park opposite the pub and driving off. I looked across the road and see this car pull out the car park and sort of come towards us. But as it come towards us, he sort of swerved off and went down the road quite fast. We all then looked and felt, what an idiot. Kevin stays outside to keep an eye on things, and Matt comes to join him and smoke a cigarette. What happens next is beyond belief. It is astonishing no one is killed, but it's shocking to see. The troublemaker has returned in his car and now accelerates towards the pub at high speed. Matt is chatting to a friend with his back to the road, totally unaware of the danger. My mate, his face just dropped. I've never seen his face go like that. And I was like, right, something's wrong, and the impact happens. The car hits Matt with extreme force. The voice in my head literally just went, you just died. In the moment before the impact, Kevin senses danger. For some unknown reason, I just looked over my shoulder, and I just jumped. The car misses him by inches. Had I not looked over my shoulder, I would have been under the car. Some of the people inside are hit by flying bricks and debris. It's a miracle no one is badly hurt. But outside, Matt, who's taken the full brunt of the impact, has been injured. I remember all the noises, like the crashing, the banging, a bit of shouting, screaming. My mate, he's just going, May, May, Matt, right. I could hear it, but I couldn't reply to any of it. Like, my head wasn't, like, back in the seen again, I was elsewhere, and then I come to. My right leg's like on top of the bonnet, and that's when Kev come over. My first thought was to get him off the car. I lifted him off the car, and then he had just collapsed on the floor. My right leg had been broken, so when I come down, I come down on my right leg, and I've literally just taken about two more steps and just gone to the ground. Upstairs, Sarah has seen the crash happen on the CCTV. It took over the screen. The impact shook the building, and I couldn't see my husband. I thought my husband was dead. That was my first thought. My husband, I'd, he's dead. And that's when I went into shock and started screaming. In her bedroom, Sarah's eldest daughter, Leah, has heard the collision. She ran into the front room, looked out the window, and she came running back to me. She said, Mum, Dad's fine, calm down. It was a massive sense of relief. But I was still shaking, I was still crying. A few seconds after the crash, landlord Kevin comes to his senses and realises the danger is far from over. There's petrol in his car. My thoughts then turned to the people in the pub and my family. The kids were upstairs, my wife was upstairs, who was seven months pregnant. My next step was make sure everybody's out of this pub because the car's going to go up. But the emergency services are several minutes away. Kevin needs to evacuate the area himself, fast. Later, Kevin realises the troublemaker is still inside the car and emotions are running high. It's down to him to avoid a riot. There were some real angry people that wanted to go for the driver because they've injured their mate, you know, they could have killed us all. Madness has happened. It's a scary situation. On Court Red Handed, we've often seen charity collection tins being stolen from cafes, 
pubs, fast food takeaways, car showrooms, ice cream parlours, even pet stores. Apart from simply snatching tins, some thieves use deception techniques to steal the money people have donated to good causes. Like this man who walks into a garage shop in Derby. He's not there for fuel or food. He's got his eye on the charity collection boxes on the counter. The man uses the distraction of paying for something with his right hand, while he steals a box containing money meant for charity with his left hand. The garage owner, who's just off camera, spots him and tells him to put the tin back. But the thief makes a hasty exit, clutching the charity tin. The owner isn't going to let him get away with it. He sets off after him, but as he reaches the door, the man reappears, miraculously without the tin. The thief's hoping the owner will believe he didn't steal anything, but the owner isn't easily fooled. He goes and checks the litter bin outside the store, and lo and behold, there's the collection tin hidden inside. The thief makes a run for it, but the owner tackles him, even though the man could be violent. He struggles to break free, but the owner keeps hold and manages to pin him against a wall. Then, with help from other customers, the man is pulled into the shop until the police arrive. The crook later pleaded guilty to theft and was given a community order and a fine. The owner's determined action means that instead of the charity losing money, in the end, it's the thief that's out of pocket. Three men enjoy an expensive meal in a restaurant and then try to sneak off without paying for it. For starters, one leaves, followed by another. But when the last one does a runner, the owner chases after him and drags the man back to the table. It looks like he's going to get his just desserts, but his next course of action is a shock for everyone. In the Scottish city of Perth, Christian runs an Italian restaurant, though he and his wife Christina are originally from Romania. Three years ago, we decided together to do something for ourselves, so my dream was to open my own restaurant. And that involved borrowing a lot of money from the bank. It was a risk, but they haven't looked back. Christian named the restaurant after his three sons, and it's grown in popularity. People are happy when they see family business. The business is like our bread. Christian works hard to ensure his staff, like waitress Alice, feel part of the family too. It's lovely because he helps us a lot. He works exactly like us. He's not a boss, he's like a, an employee. Since they opened, they've never had any trouble at the restaurant. But they are about to find out in frightening fashion that there are some customers who will go to any length to get a free meal. It's a Wednesday evening. The restaurant's open and Christian and Alice are both on shift. Just after 8.30 p.m., the external security camera shows three men approaching the entrance. When they get inside, Alice greets them. I asked if they want to sit on the window area. They refuse that table and they want to stay on the first table close to the doors. Once seated, over the next three quarters of an hour, the men order and consume starters and sirloin steaks plus drinks. After we bring the meal, after five minutes, we ask them if everything was right. And they said everything was beautiful. Then one of the men gets up and goes outside. As soon as he's away from the front door, he breaks into a run and legs it round the corner. A few minutes later, another one of the diners gets up, puts his coat on and heads outside. Even though the first man still hasn't come back, Christian and Alice aren't suspicious. People go out, smoke cigarettes. They usually take their time. 
outside, the second man has lit up. But after a couple of puffs, he too disappears into the distance. Although one diner is still eating at the table, as the minutes pass, Christian starts to worry about his missing companions. They didn't come back, so I say to Alice, watch table one because something will happen. And Christian is soon proved right. After racking up a £108 bill with his mates, the last man makes his move. I just turned around and I saw him going to the back to the toilets. Christian follows him. He didn't see I'm behind him. The man goes outside and makes a run for it, but he has Christian and a waiter hot on his heels. I catch him close to the gates outside. I ask him why he's running without paying. The man says he wasn't running out and that his wallet is still on the table. Back inside, Alice has found it. I thought, oh my God, I don't know what happened. He has his wallet here, so it should be okay. But it soon becomes clear it's not okay when Christian comes back in with a man and checks the wallet. His wallet was empty. It was like a trick. Christian orders the man to sit down while he phones the police. Police, what's the address of the emergency? Hi, good evening again, Christian from Brothers Restaurant. Yeah, uh -huh. how can I help? And I have some customers and they want to run out without paying, so I catch one of them. How many customers were there? There were three of them. Three of them, and what, did yeah, two, and two, two of them run out? Two of them, two of them, they ran out already and I catch another one. As Christian talks to the police, the man looks towards the table and sees two steak knives that haven't been cleared away. Seconds later, he grabs them and charges at Christian. He put both knives over to, to me, so I took a chair to protect myself. Alice watches on in horror. I was shocked when I saw the man with the knives. I didn't know how to react. I was like a statue. Screaming at the top of his voice, the man runs out, but Christian follows him. Outside, the attacker lunges at him with the knives. He catch me on, on the belly. The man sprints around the corner. Despite being cut, Christian pursues him. I follow him, but I never catch him. A few minutes later, the police arrive at the restaurant. They take a copy of Christian's CCTV recording and fingerprints from the cutlery and glasses. The police took one of the knives from the corridor here and another one, they find it on the road. Luckily, Christian's stomach wound isn't serious, but he's still determined to track down the knifeman and his accomplices. It's not right to do what he did, what they did. Christian puts images of his attacker and the other two men online. The response from social media was in seconds. Most of the people, they say the same names, and all of them was locals. And Christian's appeal doesn't just help him identify them. It creates such a stir in the area that the mother of one of the men involved comes into the restaurant to beg forgiveness for her son. Very apologetic. She cried. She said that it's very hard for her. I said, just ask them to come here to apologize, to bring the money, and everything would be fine with them. The two men who left the table first duly turn up to apologize and settle the bill. I was OK with the two of them, but the third one I was very angry with. The man who launched himself at Christian with the steak knives is still at large. He was free, so I was afraid. It seemed like every man on the streets looked like him. This man couldn't be free. Christian continues his social media appeal for information, and it pays dividends. He's given two potential addresses for the knifeman and passes them on to the police. Within hours, the man is arrested. When I heard he'd been caught, I felt relieved. In court, the man pleaded guilty to assault. He was given a community payback order to be supervised for 12 months and sentenced to complete 135 hours of unpaid work.
In the time since the incident, Alice and Christian have put it behind them and moved on. And so has one of the offenders, who came in and apologised. He's got a proper job now, good man now, and working hard. And Christian also continues to work hard. He's recently opened another restaurant in Perth, so he'll be serving many more customers, hopefully paying ones. It's very rare for someone to be confronted by a criminal with a weapon. But what should people do if they were to find themselves in such a frightening situation? Be aware that confronting offender could escalate the situation quite quickly. You have no idea who this person is or what their background is, and they could be used to violence. Never confront a person unless you absolutely feel it's necessary to do so. Importantly, we don't want to get into a corner, whether that be you getting into a corner where you're trapped, or just as importantly, that the offender's trapped and therefore feel the need to actually increase the use of violence or potential violence towards you. Try and put space between you because that gives you time to react. So perhaps use a barrier, a table, a sofa, a car, um, you know, a, a cashier's desk, anything at all that can basically give you that added protection. Anything you can do to raise the alarm about uh, crime in action uh, is going to help to keep you safe because suspects don't want to get caught, they will run away. So scream, bang, shout, whatever you need to do, cause a commotion, get people to come to your aid and they will. We're back in New Romney, Kent, at the Sinkport's Arms, where a man who's just been thrown out for behaving violently has driven his car at high speed into the pub entrance. The shocking and frightening moment was captured on CCTV. The car hit one of the customers, Matt, and narrowly missed landlord Kevin. Kevin has pulled Matt out of the wreckage. He's miraculously survived the impact, but his leg is badly broken. My body was so numb with adrenaline. I had a lot of blood over me and cuts and everything. Kevin calls 999. He's worried the car might explode. And that's not his only problem. The driver's trapped inside and a furious mob is surrounding the car. He was stuck in the car. There were some real angry people that wanted to go for the driver because they've injured their mate, they could have killed us all. There was that to deal with, as well as the fact of the car blowing up, as well as injured people. Kevin calms the situation as much as possible and stops anyone getting to the driver. But he's also worried about his family and shouts across to his business partner, Sharon. The kids were upstairs, my wife was upstairs, who was seven months pregnant. And I just said, get my family, get the kids out. If that car would have caught fire, the building would have been on fire. Kevin's wife, Sarah, is frozen with shock because she witnessed the horrific crash as it happened on the pub's CCTV cameras. My eldest, Leah, she took control. She went and took my son out of his bed and got my other daughter, and they went downstairs to safety. I'd then been told by Sharon that the kids were all safe, and then it was really just the punters to get them out of the building. Inside the pub, bar staff prepare fire extinguishers in case they're needed. Outside, Kevin and Sharon try to clear the customers, except people who are tending to Matt. Everyone was brilliant, especially one of my mates. Like, he was literally with me the whole evening. He wouldn't let me stop talking. He was like, if you stop talking, you might go under shock. My brother drove down. He was just like, knelt down next to me. I just went quiet. He's like, are you all right? And I was like, no. And that's when I first got a bit emotional about it all. Like, hit me what happened. Madness has happened. Sarah arranges for a friend to take their children to a relative's house. And a few minutes later, the emergency services arrived to take control of the situation. Once they were there, it was sort of a big relief. The carnage stopped, the police had closed the road off, the emergency services cut him out of the car. They had the man in custody. Matt is carried to an ambulance by his friends and taken to hospital. There's literally about seven doctors around me, and I'm like, this is quite intense. And my right leg had been broken. I broke my arm as well. Horrible bruising all down my back. Unlike Matt, Kevin and Sarah escape physical injury, but they still suffer psychological scars in the days that follow. Our emotions, I don't think they really hit us till the following day when you've got time to sit and think about it. 
And I just found Kev in a dark room and he was really upset. I think it just hit him. I broke down a bit. I was just a bit of a mess. I think that it was, what if I hadn't turned around? I don't know if it weren't my time or what, but yeah, I think that look, looking over def definitely saved my life. I thank God that there was no fatality and it could have been a million times worse. Unbelievably, the 24-year-old driver of the car tries to deny the crime. He went on for ages, like, not pleading guilty or not really admitting to it for ages, and which was like, how can you not admit to what you've done? So the police need to prove the crash was deliberate. Police technical investigators use the CCTV footage to determine the driver's speed. 30 miles per hour at impact with no sign of braking. Their engineers examine the vehicle and find no evidence of mechanical fault. Also, they can see how when he gets into his car, he drives off on the wrong side of the road with his lights off and in the opposite direction to home. The video evidence means police are able to build a compelling case. He meant to hurt people that night. Obviously, he had kicked off beforehand. He'd been thrown out of a pub. And I think, yeah, he did just snap, but he has done it deliberately. The man eventually sees sense and realises there's no point denying the crime any longer. In court, the driver pleaded guilty to assault by beating, causing grievous bodily harm with intent and causing serious injury by dangerous driving. He was jailed for 12 years. Matt is now fully recovered and watching the CCTV footage reinforces to him how lucky he was that night. This is like a ragdoll, you know? I don't know how I survived that. That was crazy. But the traumatic episode hasn't changed his outgoing approach to life. Yeah, I've always lived up to the full, taking risks, like taking chances. Maybe I'm more aware that life can be taken away at any given moment, but still I'm enjoying myself. Kevin and Sarah are also enjoying life again, following the arrival of their fourth child, Arthur. The front of their pub was repaired good as new, and they've installed safety bollards outside on the pavement. Despite what happened, they still want to make their new business a success. When I watch it now, it still is quite scary. You know, it still chokes me a bit, but you only get one shot at life, and I think, you know, you've got to take it with both hands. That's all for today. You've seen just a few of the thousands of criminals who are captured on camera every year. Join us next time to see more villains who've been caught red-handed. Yeah.